What's up guys, I'm Ari Rochelle and this is Too Deep. In our previous video, The Gods Part 1, we answered the question, are other gods real? We read verses like Exodus 12, 12, which states that God brought judgment on the gods of Egypt. Deuteronomy 10, 17, which states that our God is the God of gods. And Psalms 82, verses 6 through 7, which states that God Almighty called other celestial beings gods as well as several other verses so if you haven't seen that video i'd suggest you go check it out because it's a pretty great video if i do say so myself and it lays the foundation for this one so with that said we left off the last video with the question what are the other gods now it's easy to just say they're celestial angels and call it a day but if you've been watching our channel for a while you know that celestial angels aren't actually a type of being but a job description which is why jesus various celestial beings and various humans are referred to as angels throughout scripture for more on that check out our video what are angels which is under our too deep category so with that said, I believe that the gods with a little g are possibly different kinds of celestial beings. Now, the Bible doesn't ever come out and blatantly say, hey, the gods are this being and the gods are that being. To actually find out the answer to our question, it took a lot of digging and research. And then, to be honest, I, I still didn't find the answer. I only came across the answer when I was just reading the Bible one day and I wasn't actually searching for the answer to this question. I read Deuteronomy 4, 15 through 20, which I had read several times before, but it wasn't until the other day that I actually grasped what it was saying. So Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 15 through 20. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully, since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. And beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars all the host of heaven you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them things that the lord your god has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven but the lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace out of egypt to be a people of his own inheritance as you are this day did you catch that Moses was talking to the people of Israel and how they shouldn't make a carved image of anything. Then he moves on to worshiping the host of heaven because that's not for the people of Israel. Why? Let's read that again if y'all don't mind. Verses 19 and 20. And beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars all the host of heaven you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them things that the Lord your God has allotted to all the peoples under the whole heaven but the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace out of Egypt to be a people of his own inheritance as you are this day notice how Moses inspired by the Holy Spirit connects the worship of the host of heaven with Egypt if you remember from part one God brought judgment on the God of Egypt. Let's read that real quick. Exodus 12, 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. So then, could it be that the gods of the other nations, such as Egypt, were the host of heaven? That then begs the question, what are the host of heaven specifically? Well, Moses lets us know in verse 19 he equates the host of heaven to the sun the moon and the stars now with this newfound information if we go back to the very first time we read about the sun the moon and the stars we'll see something a little different Genesis chapter 1, 14 through 19. And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. Here's a few things I want you guys to notice. First, God says, let there be lights in the expanse to separate the day from the night. These lights are for signs, seasons, days, and years. Basically, 
they're like a calendar in the second heaven that's what we call space now here's the second thing after god sets the light in the expanse he then creates two great lights the moon and the sun these two lights are specifically to rule over the day and rule over the night as we see in verse 16. he then lumps in the stars with the moon and the sun but did you notice that god separated the first set of lights and what their purpose is and the second set of lights and what their purpose is did you catch that here's the third thing i want you to notice the word translated here as rule is the hebrew word memselet which means dominion authority and to rule it's also translated as forces as in an army in second chronicles 32 verse 9. this is something most of us don't really think of as a big deal at least i know i didn't until i read the verse in deuteronomy 4 19 through 20 that we just read here's a question for you guys to ponder if the sun is just a hot ball of glowing gas and the moon is just a giant space rock that reflects the sun, how can they rule over anything? I mean, sure, you could say that God created them just to bring light to the earth, but as we just read, the main purpose of the sun and the moon was to rule over the day and to rule over the night. Now, many will say, okay, that proves absolutely nothing. All right, well, no biggie, MBD. Let's fast forward a bit to the time of Joshua. Now, Joshua is fighting a war at Gibeon and the Lord is fighting with him. In fact, the Lord is taking out more of Joshua's enemies with large stones from heaven than Joshua and his army were with the sword. So the Lord's fighting on Joshua's behalf and just taking out the, the enemy. Yet look at what Joshua says to the Lord. Joshua chapter 10 verse 12 through 15. At that time Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, sun stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Aijalon. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. So Joshua returned and all Israel with him to the camp of Gilgal. Here's, here's the question for you guys. Why would Joshua need to call for the sun and the moon to stand still? It literally makes no sense. The Lord had thrown the Amorites into a panic before the people of Israel. He was literally fighting on behalf of them with hailstones from heaven. So why would Joshua call for the sun and the moon to stop? To me, this makes no sense unless the sun and the moon were fighting on behalf of the Amorites. Now, some would say that it's because the sun was setting and Joshua wanted vengeance on his enemies and Israel didn't fight at night. Well, the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead didn't need the sun to seek revenge on the Philistines for what they did to Saul, which is recorded in 1 Samuel 31 verses 10 through 13. Jehoram, he didn't need the sun to fight against Edom when they revolted against him, recorded in 2 Chronicles 21, 8 through 10. Now, some could say, well, that was because those were sneak attacks. Well, okay, here's the thing. God was fighting on Israel's behalf. He's taking out more Amorites with hailstones than Israel can kill with the sword. And on top of that, it's the middle of the day. Now, why do I say that? Let's read verse 13 one more time. And the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day. The sun stopped in the midst of heaven. In other words, it stopped in the middle of the sky, which would be like high noon. The sun wasn't about to set. They had a full day of fighting left. On top of that, why didn't Joshua just wait for, for the next day to fight if he didn't want to fight at night? He didn't need the sun to stand still. And if it's just about sunlight, then Joshua wouldn't need the sun and the moon to stand still as well. If the sun is already at a standstill, why would he call for the moon to also stand still? But if the sun and the moon are gods, then it makes sense why both the sun and the moon had to stand still in the sky in order for him to get vengeance on his enemies. In fact, let's look at verse 14 one more time. There has been no day like it before or since when the Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. It says that the Lord fought for Israel and so he heeded the voice of a man. 
Why would it matter if God was fighting for Israel or not for the sun to stand still and the moon to stand still? That makes no sense. What does that have to do with the Lord fighting for Israel? Oh, it's because he wanted them to win. Well, the sun didn't need to stand still, nor did the moon need to stand still for Israel to win. If they're just lights in the sky, then they don't need to be at a standstill in order for God to show that he's fighting for Israel. But if they are the gods of the Amorites, then it would be like how God said, I'm going to bring judgment on the gods of Egypt as well as the Egyptians. Like how we just read in Exodus 12, 12. But if the sun and the moon were the gods of the Amorites and they were fighting on behalf of the Amorites against Israel, then it all makes sense. Now, this would also make sense why there were so many ancient gods like Ra, Adam, Hyperium, Helios, Apollo, and Sol, which are all sun gods. This would also make sense why we have so many moon gods as well, such as Konos and Selene, Artemis, Diana, Luna, Mani, Chandra, or Soma. So then that just begs the question, what about the stars? Aren't the stars a part of the host of heaven as well? Why aren't they mentioned? Well, let's fast forward a little more. Judges chapter 5 verse 20. From heaven the stars fought, from their courses they fought against Sisera. How can a ball of burning or glowing gas fight against a commander of an army, let alone a human army? Look at, look at what God recalls about the children of Israel during their time in the wilderness, as well as what their punishment was. Amos chapter 5, verses 25 through 27. Did you bring to me sacrifices and offerings during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You shall take up Sikath, your king, and Kion, your star god, your images that you made for yourselves, and I will send you into exile beyond Damascus says the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. God literally says, you didn't worship me in the wilderness. You brought me no sacrifice, so I will give you over to Sikath, an Assyrian god apparently, to be your king, and Kion, another Assyrian god, for you to worship. He even gives them over to the images that they made for themselves. But did you catch what God calls Kion? A star god. Apparently, Kion is connected to the star Saturn. If you're wondering why I said star instead of planet, check out our video, Is Science Always Right?, which is under our too deep category, as we don't have enough time to get into that in this video. So, with that said, if the stars aren't just balls of burning gas in the sky, then it would make sense why it was such a big deal that Lucifer wanted to place his throne on high above the stars of God. Let's read that real quick. Isaiah chapter 14 verse 13. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. Now, I used to believe that that was just simply saying that he was trying to physically set his throne above the stars of God. Like he was just trying to go above the second heaven, which is what we call space, into the third heaven where God abides. But what if it's more than that? What if it's God explaining that Lucifer's desire was to be equal with the God of gods, not just a simple place to put his throne? God was literally saying, you're trying to go above the gods to be equal with the God of gods. So the gods, with the little g, are the host of heaven, the sun, the moon, and the stars. This now makes sense why the sun, the moon, and the stars are darkened on the day of the Lord. Joel chapter 2 verse 10 through 11. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful, for the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Why would the heavens tremble before the Lord if it's not them who will also receive his wrath? Joel also prophesies this again in Joel chapter 3 verse 13 through 16. Put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread for the wine press is full. The vats overflow for their evil is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord roars from Zion 
and utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth quake. But the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. Again, Joel prophesies that the Lord will come for his people and then pour out his wrath on the wicked. But what keeps catching my eye is that the sun, the moon, and the stars, they go dark. They don't shine their light, as well as both the heavens and the earth, both of them quake or tremble before the Lord. Why would the heavens tremble if there is nothing in them that will receive the wrath of the Lord? Now, if we fast forward 800 plus years, we find Jesus prophesying about the same day. Let's read that real quick. Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 through 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So if the sun, the moon, and the stars are not the gods, then why would their lights going out or the stars falling from heaven equate to the powers of the heavens being shaken? Now, some may bring up Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 3, which says, and has gone and served other gods and worshiped them or the sun or the moon or any of the host of heaven, which I have forbidden. The word translated as the first or is the Hebrew word, I'm not even going to try, that can be translated as that is. In fact, it's a completely different word than the last two words translated as or in that same sentence. So this verse doesn't necessarily destroy this argument. In fact, it seems to solidify that the gods of old are in fact the host of heaven. So we could translate this verse as and has gone and served other gods and worshiped them. That is the sun or the moon or any of the host of heaven that I have forbidden. So the host of heaven, the sun, the moon and the stars seem to be the other gods. Now, here's the last thing that I'd like to point out to you guys. The word translated as host in the phrase, the host of heaven, is the Hebrew word sabah, which means army or military congregation as a large fighting unit or horde. The host of heaven are like heaven's military. So this would make sense why the sun, the moon, and the stars rule the day and the night, as well as why they fight on behalf of people. So the gods weren't actually created for worship. In fact, they were created to rule. They were created to keep the wicked in check. They were created to bring justice. They were created to take care of the people. Now with that said, some may bring up that first verse that we read, Deuteronomy chapter four, verses 19 and 20, that say that basically the Lord gave the people of the earth to worship the sun, the moon, and the stars, but he took Israel out of that. And he called them as his own inheritance. So if he gave that to the other nations as their allotment, if you will, then why would that be a sin? Well, let's tackle that in another video because we don't have enough time in this one. So with that said, let's just sum everything up for you guys real quick. The gods of old are the host of heaven, which are the sun, the moon, and the stars. There are military leaders in the heavenly places that rule the day and rule the night. When Jesus comes back to get his bride, the church, which is us, he will shake the powers of the heavens by darkening the sun and the moon as well as the stars falling from heaven. The gods were not created for worship and said they were created to be rulers to keep the nations in check and to judge the earth. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you did, please feel free to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our channel, and until next time, God bless.